Welcome to Jack's In Conversation. I'm delighted today to have Professor Morten Maldahl of the University of Copenhagen, this year's uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, uh, for his uh, pioneering work on uh, click reactions. Professor uh, Maldahl is not only professor in Copenhagen, but head of the Center for Evolutionary and Chemical Biology, deputy head of the Department of Education in Chemistry, um, founder of a number of companies, including Betamab, and founder of the Society for Combinatorial Chemistry. He obtained a master's degree in chemical engineering uh, from the Technical University of Denmark, where he also obtained a doctorate degree. From there, he went on to do postdoctoral studies at Cambridge University in the United Kingdom in an area very different from chemical engineering and molecular biology. He's been uh, elected member of the Royal Danish Academy of Science. He is considered to be a leader in a number of areas, combinatorial chemistry, uh, polymer chemistry, uh, synthesis, uh, automation, receptor biology, development of uh, novel assays, biomolecular recognition, just to name a few. So I'm delighted to be able to have you uh, here today and uh, we can discuss uh, science, chemistry, uh, Jacks and education, which I know is a topic that is very dear uh, to you. Uh, but first, I got to start with a, a question that I'm sure everyone's dying for me to ask of you. What was it like when you got that call about one month ago, early in the morning um, in October? First of all, I would like to thank you for this uh, very uh, kind introduction and also for this opportunity. And then uh, on the 5th of October, I was actually not expecting anything. I was just sitting preparing videos for my students when the telephone rang. And uh, first I was a little bit confused because two years ago before uh, this year, uh, we had a small joke played by the students on me uh, where a Norwegian guy, he called me up and said, this is from Stockholm, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I was uh, thinking immediately, this is another joke they are playing on me. But it was real this time, and uh, I was very, very, very honored. What was your experience like as a young faculty? As a young faculty, I was extremely interested in the science that was available at the Technical University. Uh, we were looking at carbohydrates from a very uh, advanced point of view. And uh, one of the reasons for that was that I had a mentor, Klaus Bock, who was an expert in uh, nuclear warehouse and en in enhancement studies. So all my molecules were studied at the most advanced structural level possible at, in those days. And uh, this was extremely exciting and uh, drove me to go to the lab uh, late at night and so on. So faculty in the early days was extremely uh, exciting for me. I've noticed you led a very interdisciplinary program, always at the cutting edge. Um, so what do you think was the critical to that success that you've had throughout your career? I've always been extremely interested in nature as such, even when I was a child. I love to spend my time in nature and wonder about everything that uh, happens there. So when I got into the research in, uh, in the engineering studies, I was really feeling lucky because this allowed me to uh, get more of a scientific insight into all of this beauty that I love so much from, uh, from my childhood. And uh, therefore, I never sort of uh, focused on a single uh, kind of science. And it, I wasn't driven uh, by, uh, by ambition. I was driven by the interest and the curiosity uh, to try to explain uh, what we are seeing and what we are uh, experiencing uh, in, in chemistry. Who are your heroes um, at a young age, your heroes in science um, or chemistry or society in general? Yeah, so if you look at it, I have, of course, my mentors, which are always heroes uh, for you, because, uh, as I said, uh, Klaus Bock was uh, one of the most lucky uh, meetings I had in my life. Uh, he was uh, my mentor during my PhD study. And uh, I also had a, a very enthusiastic uh, a mentor during my master's studies, Jan Ugo Massen. And then uh, 
Later on, I learned about biomolecules by Klaus Bredam at the Carlsberg Laboratory. And uh, he was one who introduced me to the world of proteases. So uh, I have had a lot of uh, inspiring mentors. And then uh, if you ask me about inspiration from uh, abroad, from other universities, I would like to mention Hans Paulsen and Raymond Lebieu from Canada, uh, Hans Paulsen from uh, Germany, Bob Shepard, who was uh, my mentor in Cambridge during my postdoctoral stay. Uh, I would like to mention John Goodenough, who uh, got the uh, uh, Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for lithium batteries. I think he is a fantastic uh, example. He is now uh, very old, but still running an active uh, research group. I also love the work of H.C. Brown. And uh, uh, Pregosin is one of my heroes. Uh, I uh, met Pregosin at the uh, Nobel event in Switzerland. You have this uh, young people can meet up with Nobel laureates. Uh, in Lindau, and uh, I met Pregosin there. I had the personal talk with him for an hour or so, and this was a fantastic experience that was really, really inspiring. I also uh, like uh, Casey Nicolau, and M.G. Finn uh, is one of my <laughs> heroes. Yeah, and then uh, I have a Japanese hero, Aida. Oh, yeah, if you know of course. Aida. Yeah. Is a fantastic uh, researcher as well. Yeah, so they, those were some of them, but there are so many that you could actually mention. And uh, I think that we are all standing on the shoulder of uh, giants. You know, uh, with our research, we only make small steps forward. And a lot of people went in before that and did a lot of work to make it possible. How would you describe your own experience as a, as a mentor or, or a teacher? I think that uh, I, have, uh, I have achieved a great deal there because I have a lot of uh, previous postdocs and PhDs that are on uh, leading positions in all the pharmaceutical industry that is in this uh, area. I also have people who are in universities in Canada, in Germany, in Sweden, and so on. So I think that I have achieved a lot in terms of mentoring people to actually uh, take an academic approach to their research, uh, which I think is very important. Then I'm very happy that I have now a very advanced uh, organic chemistry course, and I actually use uh, the Carrie and Sundberg reactions and synthesis in this course, and this is an impossible book, so full of errors, but I still make the students like this book, so that's a very uh, high achievement, I think. I took a uh, bunch of money and ask them to uh, find these errors in the book and then they I pay them every time they find an error and that really stimulates them to read the stuff so that's good what specific advice would you have for a young individual just starting out in their career who looks to you as a mentor as a hero um, and wants to pursue a successful career in science and education yeah, so the first thing I would say, don't let your ambition and career be the target, because that's not going to lead you anywhere. Uh, it has to be your curiosity uh, that is the driver of your research. Uh, and also, uh, try not to let your own ego come in front of your colleagues and uh, in front of your co-workers. Uh, it's uh, much better to actually leave them uh, to do a collaborative uh, thought process. Also, you should not follow trends. Much better to actually follow what you think is right to study than to follow trends. If you follow trends, that means that somebody else already were there. And uh, then uh, don't associate yourself with a narrow field of science. Uh, some people like to, uh, you know, be professional within a quite narrow field of science. And I think that uh, the, everything new happens on the periphery of fields. So if you can actually bridge between the fields, that's much better for novelty. Uh, and then uh, learn to leave your comfort zone. Your career has cer certainly reflected that. I noticed that you've done work in oligosaccharides and peptides, solid phase, uh, chemical biology. So um, you, you've been true to the advice that you're providing for the young. And indeed, it is um, a great uh, advice. 
Um, I'm curious, um, when you were writing your JOC paper, which I remember reading back in 2002, um, the, the crux of the paper is mostly about peptidomimetics, I guess, right? Did you ever think yeah. that the chemistry itself would, um, would be so powerful? It's been cited thousands of times. Well, we, uh, we actually knew that it was something special because uh, what Christian Tornu, who was uh, the PhD working on this project, he, uh, he saw was uh, that he got a byproduct and he, he came to me and said, I cannot make my project work. So we looked at it and we found out that you can actually have an acid chloride and try to react that with a nucleophile. Uh, but if there's an azide present, that acid chloride doesn't react with anything. It's just reacting to make the uh, triazole. So we could see already there that this was a very specific reaction that was orthogonal to other types of chemistry. So once we have formed the tri tri triazole, we could take another nucleophile and react it with the acid chloride. So that actually showed us that this was a very unique uh, situation. But and what made you try copper? So we were trying to do an acylation of an alkyne with an acid chloride that also contained an acide. We had developed acido acids as a, a way of uh, doing peptide synthesis in the years uh, previous, uh, previous years before this, and we just took this technology and tried to use it for isolation of alkynes. And uh, then the alkynes uh, were not isolated; they just reacted to, to form the triazole in the presence of copper one. So success always comes to the prepared mind. Huh? Um... It wasn't, exactly. I guess it's fair to say, it wasn't the reaction you were trying to get, but um, you recognize its significance. Yes, you, you should not trash uh, the uh, serendipitous observation. I think they are always, if they are not expected, they are always containing some sort of opportunity. Your position of uh, chemistry as a natural science, where does it fit in this wonderful collage that includes um, all of us scientists of various disciplines that are interested in asking fundamental questions of how nature works. My uh, point of view on that is that there are two fundamental sciences, and that is physics and chemistry, which uh, in reality describes everything. And other sciences are more or less like a derivative of, uh, of chemistry. So that includes our nanoscience, our uh, you know medicinal uh, chemistry, our uh, yeah, all sorts of uh, biology itself is also a kind of a chemistry uh, derived uh, science. So I think that science is uh, omnipresent, it's everywhere around us. There's all sorts of uh, chemistry uh, going on. There's all the life sciences, there's uh, polymer chemistry, there's uh, macromolecular chemistry, there's uh, all sorts of chemistries around us, and uh, we just need to plug into that, uh, you know, in a much more serious way uh, with the children from the very beginning of their schools. The kids actually can maintain uh, visual uh, memories for a long time in their life. And I think that we should uh, teach the young kids visually about chemistry in a correct way. If you had to design a uh, new educational program, um, what would you do differently? What would you focus on? Uh, to keep that excitement going. So you would need teachers with much more uh, knowledge about natural sciences. And then uh, you would also need uh, to produce very entertaining material for the kids. Also utilize uh, virtual chemistry as much as we possibly can, and maybe even have, uh, you know, uh, people helping, facilitating uh, this for the young children so that it becomes more entertaining, giving personality to the atoms and so on. I uh, got my interest in chemistry uh, partly due to uh, the possibility of going out to a vendor and buying all these explosives and uh, you know metal powders and whatever. And so I made rockets that were much better than any rocket you can buy today. <laughs> but that, that, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. So I think that hands-on is very important for creating this interest. I don't say that you should make rockets today because uh, <laughs> not something I can recommend for for young people. I'm always struck by the fact that um, 
people don't seem to get the importance of chemistry, how it affects our everyday lives, uh, the medicines we ingest, the food we eat, uh, the phones we use. I'm, I'm wondering if, if you could comment on how we um, make chemistry, how we make people more uh, cognizant of the importance of chemistry. Chemistry is omnipresent. It's everywhere. Everything around us is chemistry. And uh, we are chemistry ourselves. So I think we have a lot of problems in front of us, including all the environmental problems. Uh, so how do we get better solar cells? How do we get uh, windmill wings that are uh, not uh, made from, uh, you know, uh, glass and plastic uh, that will, uh, you know, when it erodes later on, uh, it would be a big, big problem. And uh, also, uh, we have uh, maybe new ways of generating energy uh, that could be invented from uh, new chemistry uh, if, we, if we look at uh, what are the options uh, today. Yeah, I think you're totally correct. I, I think there's hope on the horizon. A lot of the problems that you've just described, chemistry seems to be associated with in a positive way and contributing solutions uh, to those problems. And so I think there's, there's reason to be hopeful. So you published in JAX. Let me ask, do you have a favorite uh, publication of yours in JAX? Yes, I do. Uh, I love the one uh, because it also was uh, the initiation of a, a program, the one called SPOC, a resin for solid phase organic chemistry and enzymatic reactions on solid phase. That was a core uh, publication from, for us. And it also formed the, the basis for a, a number of subsequent um, publications on the uh, intermolecular N-acetaminium ion reactions that, that we, I think we had like 10 or, or more publications on that. Uh, and the, the first observation of this reaction was in this first paper on the spark racing. If you ask me for what is uh, your favorite JAX publication in general, I love the publications by uh, Scott Miller. Oh, of and course. I think uh, one of his publications, uh, Polymeric Fluorescent Gel for Combinatorial Screening of Catalyst, Catalyst is a, a very important paper that I like. It actually, in that paper, uh, he uh, formed the basis for a lot of the uh, subsequent research in his group. I know Scott well. We were both uh, colleagues uh, in graduate school in the Evans group back in the in the 1980s. In your opinion, what can JAX do better? I think that you are doing everything right uh, in JAX, uh, more or less. You are not publishing uh, very specific uh, research. You are publishing more research of general interest, and I think that's uh, very important. And also, you publish full papers, and I like that very much. Uh, you don't set uh, sort of a very short limit on uh, how much you can put in your paper. What you can do better? Yeah, you can accept my papers when they're good. <laughs> That's a very common uh, suggestion. You're not alone in that respect. <laughs> I like all the ACS papers, actually. I, I really like ACS, the way they uh, operate. I published a lot in JOC and in combinatorial chemistry or combinatorial science uh, and uh, I think these are very good publications. So, Well, we're delighted that you've chosen us to publish your pioneering work in. Um, so thank you and keep sending us your, your papers. So you're writing grants, you're doing lab work, um, you're founding companies. How do you balance your professional and um, family life at the same time that you're a leader um, in science? I think it's important as uh, if you are doing science, that you also do other things. I have a passion for music. So I play music and I play in a band and I make guitars myself and so on. So this is a, a passion that uh, balance the engagement uh, into, the, into the scientific uh, research. Are those your guitars in the background? Uh, guitars that you made yourself? It looks complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not. I mean, if you're a scientist, you know how to do stuff. <laughs> I want to thank ACS for all their efforts. I think that uh, you're doing a wonderful job. Uh, it's I know it's hard to be an editor, uh, and uh, 
uh, there's a lot of work associated with making good uh, publications of good science. So uh, thank you very much for that. So this brings us to the end of the of the interview. I want to thank you for taking time out of what is no doubt a very busy schedule for you this time of the year. Um, we appreciate it and um, thank you. I'm glad you could be a part of this. Thank you, Eric.